Hi everybody. Namaste and welcome back to my channel Murali's World of Physics. In today's video, I am going to discuss the details about uh, the electronic instrumentation for nuclear radiation detectors. Uh, before I actually go into the topic of today's discussion, let me briefly explain the general working principle of nuclear radiation detectors. The details of this I had already uh, explained in much detail in my previous video, Introduction to Nuclear Radiation Detectors. As you know, nuclear physics deals with the structure, properties and interactions of the nucleus. The experimental investigations uh, involve studies of the radiations and particles emitted from the nucleus. Now how are these radiations or particles emitted from the nucleus? These radiations or particles are emitted from nuclei which are inherently unstable. These are the so called naturally occurring radioactive nuclei or those nuclei which are artificially made unstable by bombarding with energetic particles or radiations. Uh, the important thing in the nuclear physics studies is that such radiations and particles carry in one way or other vital information regarding the nucleus. In order to study the emanations from the nuclei in the form of particles or radiations, first of all these emanations have to be detected in some way or other. Now obviously these emanations are very small in size and therefore they are not at all detected by human sense organs or even with the help of most powerful optical microscopes. So naturally, we have to depend on some artificial devices which we can call nuclear radiation detectors in order to detect these particles or radiations. A nuclear radiation detector essentially consists of an active medium in which the incident particle or radiation interacts and that generates charged particle uh, charged ion pairs and a suitably applied electric field will collect these ion pairs. Uh, this particular process of charge collection uh, leads to the formation of an electrical signal at the output terminal of the detector. So this is in a nutshell the working principle of a nuclear radiation detector. Um, I had explained this in a previous video um, earlier. So this illustrates the working of the radiation detector. We have the active medium. Uh, which basically comprises the nuclear radiation detector. Then we have, say, let's say, two parallel plate electrodes to which appropriate voltages may be applied. So this represents the cathode and this represents the anode. So the incident particle or radiation comes like this, enters the medium and then proceeds uh, in this direction. Now, because of the interactions of this incident particle or radiation with the molecules, atoms, electrons or nuclei inside the active medium, charged ion pairs are finally generated. So these ion pairs, if they are left to themselves without any applied field, they will recombine and therefore will not get any output. On the other hand, if an appropriate electric field is applied by applying suitable voltages to the cathode and the anode, then these ions will experience an electric field and therefore, the positive ions will get collected, uh, the positive ions will get attracted towards the cathode uh, and finally get collected there and uh, the negatively charged electrons will get attracted towards the anode and then uh, they will be finally collected at the anode. So the collection of these charged particles, namely the positive ions and the negatively charged electrons will lead to a pulse at both the cathode and the anode. So we will have a positive pulse at the cathode and a negative pulse at the anode. Now if we look at the detector output pulses on an oscilloscope screen, this is what we are going to see. Now these uh, blue lines represent the signals coming out of the detector. So there are pulses of various amplitudes and uh, you can notice that these pulses occur randomly. Now this is a characteristic of nuclear uh, radiations. Namely, that these radiations are emitted at times which are randomly distributed. So you see 
that there is no constant rate at which these uh, pulses are coming. One of the important requirements uh, that a nuclear radiation detector has to satisfy is that the output pulse amplitude uh, must be proportional to the energy deposited inside the detector volume. That means V out, the amplitude of the output pulse is equal to some constant K times the energy deposited by the incident particle inside the active volume of the detector. Now, once we get the detector output, then we have to do a lot of electronic processing uh, in order that we are able to derive useful information from these signals. So, this is a general layout of the electronic setup uh, that may be required for processing the detector output pulses. So, we have the detector here. Uh, the output is fed to uh, a pre-amplifier amplifier combination. Then the output pulses from the amplifier will have to be sorted. Uh, so, for this purpose we have a single channel analyzer and then finally these pulses will be either counted in a counter timer or these amplifier pulses may be fed to a multi-channel analyzer or maybe one can also give this as input to a personal computer uh, which will have the appropriate software to analyze these pulses and then uh, derive some useful information. Also, the detector will have to be properly biased so that we need a high voltage power supply. So, all this we are going to explain in the upcoming slides. Now, the detector output pulses are usually in the level of microvolts or at the most millivolts. So, therefore, uh, these are relatively weak signals. Uh, so, therefore, for reasons of subsequent processing and counting, we need to amplify these pulses so that uh, they will come up to at least of the order of volts. So, therefore, definitely we need an amplifier uh, immediately following the detector output. And uh, the detector output pulses in many cases are not uh, having the suitable pulse shape uh, which will be useful for later processing. So, therefore, uh, we have to shape these pulses appropriately. So, we need a some amount of pulse shaping. So, therefore, these are the detector output pulses, let us say of the order of micro volts. And then we pass this through the appropriate circuits which will do the amplification as well as wave shaping. And finally, this is the type of uh, signals that we want from the output of the that particular electronic device. So, the electronic circuits which do the above jobs are called amplifiers. Usually, there are two stages of amplifier function. One is a pre-amplifier and the other is the main amplifier. So, pre-amplifier as the name itself suggests will follow the detector output immediately and then the main amplifier will be connected at the output of the pre-amplifier. Uh, of course, there are reasons why we need uh, to have two stages of the amplifier function. So, let us look at the pre-amplifier stage. Uh, normally, this will not have much gain, only some nominal gain uh, and some amount of pulse shaping and uh, usually this will be kept close to the detector. Why uh, this requirement is there? This is because the impedance of the short connecting cable will be low and therefore one can uh, reduce the noise level and also avoid possible signal attenuations. Um, Normally, the preamplifier will be of the charge sensitive type so that the output can be kept independent of the input capacitance. Also, in order to keep the noise to the minimum possible level, the input stage will be a field effect transistor stage. Um, this is basically because uh, such noise, such electronic noise will add to the detector resolution. So, therefore, we have to keep the noise to the minimum possible level. Very often the bias supply for the detector is also applied through the preamplifier. There will be a separate uh, connecting, uh, separate connector for this purpose. Uh, the connecting cable from the preamplifier to the detector may have high voltage on it because of this and they usually require special high voltage cables and connectors. Now these uh, circuit diagrams indicate the 
main types of preamplifiers commonly used. Uh, one is the current or voltage sensitive preamplifier and the other is the charge sensitive preamplifier. Um, so as the name indicates, the current or voltage sensitive preamplifier will convert the detector current to an output pulse, uh, voltage pulse and uh, in the second case, the output pulse will be proportional to the charge collected at the detector terminals. So, uh, in order to reduce the noise, as I mentioned before, uh, we will have an FET input stage here. Now, coming to the main amplifier, uh, this will be the major gain provider and also the major pulse shaper. And uh, this can be usually kept in the counting or processing mode. Actually, uh, the detector will have to detect the radiations. So, it will be naturally kept very close to the source of these radiations. And uh, there, the radiation level may not be that low. So, therefore, the experimenter himself cannot sit near the detector. So, he will have to run long cables from the output of the detector to the place where he will be sitting. Uh, to do the experiment. So, if uh, we run long cables from the output of the detector itself, then there will be severe uh, signal attenuation and by the time the signals reach the other electronics in the counting room, uh, they will be extremely weak. So, that is why we have used the preamplifier uh, basically for the impedance matching purpose. So, therefore, from the output of the preamplifier, we can run um, the required length of cables to the experimental row. <coughs> now, the main amplifier uh, is the one where the major signal amplification and pulse shaping is done. Now, why do we require pulse shaping? One of the reasons is that we want to shorten the response time for each pulse and uh, thereby pulse overlaps can be avoided, especially when the counting rates are high. Also, we would like to improve the signal to noise ratio. So, this uh, will depend on the pulse shape. And also, we want to make the amplification independent of variations in the pulse rise times. Um, this is especially because the detector output pulses, which are produced by different types of incident radiations or particles, uh, may have different pulse rise times. So, the amplification should be independent of these pulse rise times. So, that way also we need pulse shaping, appropriate pulse shaping. Also, a variety of output circuits which an amplifier may be required to drive. So, therefore, it is desirable to have its output impedance as low as possible. Uh, these are the different circuits which are commonly used for pulse shaping. So, we have the CR-RC combination, the double differentiated RC combination, or uh, this is the Gaussian wave shaping. Also, uh, many times delay lines are used for wave shaping. And these are the typical uh, shapes of the output pulses from an amplifier. Uh, this is arising from the CRRC pulse shaping circuit. This is the output of the double differentiated RC network. And uh, this represents the Gaussian output arising from the Gaussian uh, circuit. Uh, this is unipolar and this is Gaussian bipolar. And these two uh, belong to the delay line shaping category. So, which one of these would be used in an actual circuit will depend on the particular um, you know, details about the input signals which are coming from the detector. There should be linearity between the input signal and the output signal to within 0.5 percent or even better. So, this is required to keep the proportionality between the final output signal and the energy of the incident radiations. So, this effect can be achieved by a judicious choice of the operating points of the various uh, components, especially the transistors, etc., well within the linear range, and therefore um, we can keep the linearity almost constant. And of course, uh, negative feedback also can be used in, for this purpose. Now, these are the important characteristics of amplifiers. 
of course the gain should be variable from uh, unity to about 1500 also and uh, there can be two controls for this one is a coarse control and the other can be a fine control of course uh, there should be good linearity between the input and the output and it should be possible to process semi gaussian unipolar and bipolar pulses with shaping time constants varying from 0.5 microsecond to 10 microsecond the total range in which the output pulse amplitude can be varied is typically from 0 to 10 volts well in some cases it may be from 0 to 5 volts or maybe from 0 to 2 volts there should be good overall stability of the amplifier gain and uh, other things and uh, the noise should be extremely low as far as possible and uh, the input matching is such that there is high input impedance and low output impedance these are the two types of amplifier outputs uh, we have a unipolar type and a bipolar type unipolar means the pulse will have only one polarity namely it can be either positive or negative but there is only one polarity uh, in the bipolar case the leading portion uh, will have normally positive polarity and then there is a crossover from positive to negative polarity and there is a small uh, portion of the pulse which has the negative polarity. Now the point where the polarity changes from positive to negative is known as the zero crossover time. Now this is very important especially in coincidence measurements and uh, um, those experiments where timing is important. The basic point here is that the zero crossover time bears a fixed relation to the starting of the pulse and this will be independent of the pulse amplitude. So that way the zero crossover point is very important uh, in many investigations. And uh, <coughs> see the starting of the pulse will bear a relationship to the time at which the detector output pulse was produced and in turn going backwards that is the uh, that means we have a relationship between these times and the time at which the incident radiation was produced uh, in, in our experiment. So that way the bipolar pulse is very important. Now this is the amplitude and uh, this is the pulse shape. Now this is the photograph of a typical linear amplifier. Uh, we have the two controls for varying the gain. There is a coarse gain and there is a fine grain, fine gain. And uh, the shaping time also can be adjusted. Uh, say starting from 0.5 microsecond to 10 microsecond. Then we have uh, the input and output connections. Uh, and there are some other controls where uh, obviously we have to select the input pulse polarity suitably because that will depend on uh, from where we have derived the output pulse of the detector whether it is from the anode or from the cathode so depending on that the input polarity will change so accordingly we have to select the input polarity here and uh, one can also select the uh, unipolar or bipolar nature of the output pulse now these are the amplifier output signals as seen on an oscilloscope screen. Uh, this corresponds to the bipolar signals. So the signal will have both uh, polarities and this corresponds to a unipolar signal where the output has only one polarity. Once you get a properly shaped amplified version of the detector signals at the output of the amplifier, the next logical step is to measure the amplitude of the pulses and to count them um, according to their amplitudes. Now, as you already seen earlier, the pulse amplitude contains information on the energy of the incident particle in a linear mode. Our aim in the nuclear physics experiment is primarily to know the energy distribution of the particles or radiations incident on the detector. That means how many particles are there with the different energies ranging from 0 to a maximum uh, energy. Uh, this is a typical energy spectrum of radiations emitted from the beta radioactivity of a typical 
radio which are isotop let's say bismuth 2 type so this is the number of electrons emitted or rather detected and uh, this is plotted as a function of the kinetic energy so you can see that uh, these are the the red points are the experimental data points and uh, the solid red curve is actually uh, just uh, to gain the eye through the data points um, so that will be a smooth curve drawn through the data points now you can see that there is a fluctuation with respect to the red curve now the red curve is actually uh, is actually the average trend and there is a fluctuation based on this average trend now this is uh, this indicates the one of the important characteristic of um, the radioactivity process itself uh, that means it's a random process so the emission of the radiation from a radioactive nucleus uh, will be randomly distributed so we cannot predict exactly when a particular nucleus is going to decay or exactly when a particular radiation will be emitted so that is reflected in the um, fluctuations seen in the data points now on account of the linearity between the particle energy and the amplitude of the detector output pulses um, this essentially amounts to getting what is called the pulse height distribution or pulse amplitude distribution of the output pulses from the amplifier connected to the detector this is a procedure known as the pulse height analysis pha now what do we have to do uh, to obtain this pulse height spectrum so for this purpose we have to examine each output signal and sort it according to its amplitude so it will not be possible for us to do this manually so we will have to resort to some automatic um, procedure which will involve electronic modules uh, so that we will get the pulse height distribution now finally we will plot the number of pulses lying in an amplitude window delta v at the voltage level v as a function of v so that will be our final a now each such amplitude window is called a channel of the pulse height spectrum one channel of the pulse height spectrum will be the contents of a voltage window delta v at a particular voltage level so this is a typical pulse height spectrum um, in this particular case it is the spectrum of mono energetic gamma rays from a cesium 137 source so we have the data points shown here and uh, of course the solid curve is the average trend of these data points now this is what i meant uh, when i refer to one channel of the spectrum one channel or one data point so this particular data point is the number of radiations uh, which have interacted with the detector and produced output pulses so therefore so they have amplitudes lying within this window delta v at the voltage corresponding to the center of this data point so then we go to the next uh, data point it will be the number of output pulses in the next channel in the next uh, voltage window delta v at this particular voltage and so on so therefore we analyze the output pulses so that uh, we vary from 0 to some maximum voltage and at each voltage we will count the number of pulses having amplitude within this voltage window delta v a basic electronic module required for this selection of amplitudes is a pulse height discriminator a, a circuit which will discriminate Uh, between input pulses or different pulse heights so i have explained here the function of a pulse height discriminator this is the input pulse and this is the output of the discriminator 
These circuits can be used to exclude pulses which are below a preset voltage level. That means only those pulses which are above, which have amplitudes above a preset voltage level, those will be passed by the pulse end discriminator. And uh, the output will be of this particular shape. This is a standardized logic pulse output. The width will be standard and the height also will be standard. So these pulse head discriminators yield standardized logic pulse outputs for each input pulse exceeding the discriminator level setting. The common method adopted in discriminators is to have a Schmidt trigger circuit using a pair of emitter coupled transistors and using a positive feedback through connecting the collector of one transistor to the base of the other and vice versa. And this particular feedback will result in what is known as regenerative switching. So this is a simple diagram of the circuit of a pulse head discriminator, especially especially the Schmidt trigger. So we have uh, two levels VL and VH and uh, when the input amplitude exceeds VH, uh, the circuit will trigger an output and there will be a sudden rise in the output voltage and then this output voltage will remain stationary until the output falls below the lower level VL and then there is a sharp decrease to zero. So we get a square pulse as the output of the pulse height discriminator. Now the circuit in our electronic setup for nuclear radiation detectors which will use the uh, discriminator to sort our Amplifier pulses is known as the single channel analyzer. Obviously, single channel analyzer would signify that we get information about one channel at a time, single channel. So, here amplitude selection is achieved by means of a device called single channel analyzer, SCA. In simple language, pulse amplitude or pulse site analysis, that means PHA, involves selecting small amplitude intervals and seeing how many pulses lie within each of these intervals. Therefore, we need a device which will select the pulses lying within different amplitude intervals. And it is the single channel analyzer which will perform exactly this task. Uh, it is in this function that the amplitude discriminator is used in the single channel analyzer. Now in the SCA, basically two discriminators are used. One is for the lower level and the other is for the upper level. So these are referred to as lower level discriminator LLD or upper level, upper level discriminator ULD. And then the output of these two discriminators will be coupled to an anti-coincidence unit. Now what is an anti-coincidence unit? It will have two inputs and one output. Uh, how does it function? So the anti-coincidence means that it will give an output only when one of the pulses is present, the other is absent. So either two is present and one is absent or one is present or two is absent. So only in such cases the anti-coincidence unit will give an output. So we have the input signal uh, which is distributed uh, between the two inputs, one for the LLD and the other for the ULD. So here we have the two set levels VL and VU. VL let's say is equal to V, some uh, particular voltage V, let's say 5 volts and the VU will then correspond to 5 volts plus whatever window we are going to select. So 5 plus delta V. Now normally delta V uh, can be let's say 0 0.2 volt. So the set levels will be 5 volts for the LLD and 5.2 for the ULD. So how does this uh, circuit function? Suppose the input signal um, is such that it is the amplitude is below VL. So obviously it will be below VU also. So therefore there is no output from either the LLD or the ULD and therefore the anti-coincidence unit will not fire and there is no output. Now suppose 
we increase the input signal amplitude so that it just crosses VL that means V volts. So therefore now what happens the LLD will fire because its reference level is now less than the input amplitude. So therefore LLD is going to fire and give an output. So input 1 to the anti coincidence unit is active. What about uh, the ULD? We have just crossed V and we have not crossed the delta V. So therefore as far as the ULD is concerned the input amplitude is less than the set level. So therefore ULD will not fire and there is no output here. So therefore as far as the anti coincidence unit is concerned input 1 is present but input 2 is absent. So that is the appropriate uh, conditions required for the anti coincidence unit to give an output. So when the input signal amplitude is between VL and VU we will get an output. So that is our SCA output. Now what happens? Suppose we increase the input signal amplitude further and uh, suppose it crosses VU. Then obviously LLD will give an output because the set level is only V whereas the amplitude of the input signal is above V plus delta V. So this is going to fire and give an output signal. The same thing happens for ULD also. Here also the input pulse amplitude is above the set level V plus delta V and therefore ULD also will fire and give an output. So as far as the anti coincidence unit is concerned both inputs are present and from uh, the considerations of the conditions required for the inputs of the anti coincidence unit we see that there will not be any output. So this these facts are summarized in this table. So we have the input level, uh, the corresponding LLD output, the corresponding ULD output and the final SCA output. So you can see that only in this second case when the input amplitude is greater than VL but less than VU we get a final SCA output and that is exactly what we want uh, if you want to get the pulse height distribution. We want those pulses which are lying at a particular um, between a particular voltage level and that level plus delta V. So lying within a window delta V at a particular voltage. So that is exactly what the single channel analyzer is going to give us. Now this is the output of a single channel analyzer. This is again a logic pulse. Let's say 5 volt and uh, the width may be something like uh, 1 microsecond or so. Now the Single channel analyzer has basically three modes of operation. One is the called the normal mode, the second is the window mode and the third is the integral mode. So maybe I think I will start with the integral mode. In this case the ULD is, will not be operating. We have only the LLD which will be functioning. So there the set uh, voltage level is VL and therefore the SCA will pass uh, all input pulses which have amplitudes above VL. So that is why it is known as the integral mode. Now coming to the normal mode here both ULD and LLD will be effective. So here the bias levels of the two discriminators are varied independently of each other but keeping the difference constant. So that delta V will be kept constant but we vary VL and VU so that uh, the difference between them is always kept a constant equal to delta V that is known as the normal mode. Um, so this will be the mode which will be required for obtaining the pulse height spectrum. There is also what is known as a window mode in which VL and VU can be adjusted simultaneously varied but once again the difference will be a constant delta V the channel width. So this particular diagram illustrates this point uh, further, it uh, explains the three modes of operation. So this is the normal mode, this is the window mode and this is the integral mode. So in the integral mode it will accept all pulses beyond uh, VL. So here we set VL and VU independently but 
delta v is kept constant so therefore it will pass those pulses which are within this window delta v now the function here also is similar but we vary only vn so that delta v will be automatically kept a constant now this is the typical integral spectrum that we get uh, suppose you keep the vl uh, at let's say some 10 volts the maximum volts and then we go on see obviously um, our maximum energy of the incident radiations will be less than 10 volts so therefore if we keep vl at 10 volts there are no counts so essentially it is zero now suppose at this point uh, i start going below the into the photopeak region so then we get a few counts then as i go lower lower and voltages our counts will go on increasing further and further and once i cross the photopeak then there is a some sort of a um, saturation or something like that and again it will go on increasing so when i keep the bias level at zero volts i am actually getting all the output pulses uh, at the amplifier output at the input of the single channel analyzer so that's why i get an increasing tendency of the data points as we go from 10 volts downward towards zero volts so this is the integral spectrum in fact uh, we can get the now this is the differential pulse rate spectrum so here what we do we select this delta v and keep our vl at particular values and then we start from zero onwards up to the maximum point so we get each data point which contain the number of pulses at that particular voltage within delta v so this is the type of spectrum that we get so these are the data points and uh, this uh, continuous solid curve as i mentioned earlier is the average trend through the data points uh, as i had explained in our previous uh, video the main characteristic spectrum of the pulse rate spectrum the characteristic feature of the pulse rate spectrum is the photo peak and uh, the this is usually a gaussian curve centered at let's say v0 so it is this v0 which is proportional to the incident energy of the radiations v0 is equal to k into eg uh, and uh, the distribution here corresponds to what is known as the Compton distribution and that is uh, related to the Compton scattering process inside the detector volume. Now, if we compare these two, the integral spectrum and the differential pulse rate spectrum, it can be seen that one can construct the differential uh, pulse rate spectrum once we are given the integral spectrum. How come? Suppose I take the difference in the counts from successive channels. So I subtract this data point from this data point. So I get the difference between these two and that will be nothing but one of these data points. So taking any two consecutive data points in the integral spectrum, if we take the difference, we will get the corresponding point in the differential pulse rate spectrum. So there is a one to one correspondence between these two modes of uh, the spectrum. Now this is the photograph of a typical single channel analyzer. So we have the ULD and the LLD controls and uh, the selector switch for the three modes of operation integral, um, normal and window and the connectors for the input and the output. Now let us look at the typical output pulses from a single channel analyzer. So the shape of the output signal will be square pulses, standard logic pulses with definite amplitude and a definite width. Now these outputs also reflect the random nature of the nuclear radiation emissions. Now the single channel analyzer will give only one point that is one channel at a time. So suppose we have n channels in the total spectrum. So in order to collect the entire information of the total spectrum, we will require a time bt equal to n times t. 
where t is the time for which we will take the data for one channel. So as n becomes larger and larger, we require more and more time uh, in order to get the full spectrum. So many times this will be a tedious process, especially when n becomes quite large. So therefore this will take a long time if n is large. So in order to overcome this difficulty, what is known as a multi-channel analyzer has been designed. So as the name indicates, we get information about all channels in one shot, multi-channel capability. So gives all n channels simultaneously. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, the channel number is nothing but the number of digital output pulses corresponding to each of the uh, amplifier output signals. So naturally, this channel number is proportional to the input signal amplitude and the in turn to the incident radiation energy. Therefore, channel number is equal to k times c plus c. k and c are constants and uh, in order to standardize the MCA, we have to know the constants k and c. So we need an energy calibration and this is basically done using standard reference sources and uh, from that we can determine k and c because uh, if we plot n versus or rather the invert this and uh, write e as a function of n and if we plot e versus n we are naturally getting a linear curve with a certain intercept. So therefore once we get that particular line one can determine k and c. So given any unknown source uh, whose uh, energy is not uh, known, uh, then one can get the energy information from this particular calibration curve. Now at the heart of an MCA uh, is what is known as an analog to digital converter. That means it is converting analog pulses into the digital equivalent form. So here the analog pulses from the amplifier is converted into its digital equivalent. For each of the analog input signal, it gives at the output a number of square pulses. The number of such digital pulses will be proportional to the amplitude of the input signal. Therefore, the number of such digital output signals will be the channel number. N will be proportional to the amplitude of the input analog pulses and in turn to the energy of the incident radiation. So anyway, this we have already seen N is equal to Ke plus C, where K is a constant of proportionality and C is a digital offset. Thus, at any time, the contents of the memory of the multi-channel analyzer will give the energy distribution of the incident radiations. The spectrum can be displayed on a screen or printed out or can be saved as a data file for later analysis. The MCA will have a memory for sorting the spectrum. Here each channel will be assigned a memory location whose contents will be incremented by 1 each time the ADC gives a digital output which corresponds to the particular channel and also the energy of the radiation. Therefore at any time the contents of the memory will give us the energy distribution of the incident radiations and this spectrum can also be displayed on a screen or it can be printed out or it can be saved as a data file for later analysis also. So this is the uh, basic function of the multi-channel analyzer. We have the amplifier output pulses. So we are going to determine how many pulses are present in one channel namely within a bit delta V at a particular amplitude level. So, once I get this number, see I will put one point in this box. Then I go to the next V and uh, count how many pulses are there from here to delta V. Then I put that particular information into the next channel and so on. So, as and when the input pulses are coming, that will be sorted and put into the corresponding box. This is just like what a postman uh, does in a post office. See, there are various addresses which can correspond to our channels. And uh, as and when a letter is uh, found for a particular address, we will put that in the, into that box and so on. So therefore, um, as the pulses come, we see that the spectrum will build something like this. So this is the basic functional diagram of a multi-channel analyzer. We have the amplifier output passed to the ADC. It gives the digital equivalent output signals and that is given to the memory where they are sorted and then uh, placed in the appropriate memory locations. And then either it can be displayed or it can be printed out or as I mentioned we can save it as a file. Um, see the maximum number of channels into which the 
input pulse amplitude range is divided is known as the conversion gain of the multi-channel analyzer. So, depending on our requirement, we can have either 1 kmca, 2 kmca, 4 kmca or 8 kmca. So, where this 8k, 4k etc. refer to the total number of channels. And this will depend on the analog to digital converter that we have used in the MCA. So, this is a typical uh, photograph of a multi-channel analyzer. So, we see the spectrum on the screen. And uh, there are various knobs and uh, well buttons in order to control the various components of the overall functioning of the multi-channel analyzer. And uh, we can save the particular information about the spectrum in the memory or we can even um, connect the contents to the computer where one can use a appropriate software in order to do the analysis. This is the typical display screen of a multi-channel analyzer. So there are various uh, commands which can be given. The actual spectrum will be displayed here. This is the counts and this x-axis will represent the channel numbers. For example, 0, 256, 512, 768 and 1024. So this will correspond to a 1K spectrum. So suppose I start collecting the spectrum. So you can see that uh, the spectrum is building up the counts as a function of the channel number. So <clears throat> this corresponds to CCM 137 gamma rays and uh, obviously this represents the photo peak and uh, down below we have the Compton distribution and uh, here you can actually see that there is another peak at low energies. This actually corresponds to the x-rays from barium 137. So we can go on collecting the spectrum uh, for as long a period as we want and then stop acquisition and then this can be saved as a file or there is, will also be a provision uh, in the MCA software itself to find out the peak position, the full width at half maximum, uh, the total counts or the counts in the photopic region alone etc. I will end this video at this point. I will be back soon with yet another video on basic principles in physics. Till then, goodbye.